Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Very welcome to this Novation Live uh, live stream with myself, Calc. Um, it's uh, well, December. It's just turned to December 2020, and um, yeah, this evening we're going to take a look at something that, yeah, I mean, has been around for a little while, I guess. Now is the uh, the Novation circuit. But we're going to look at this from a specific point of view. We're going to look at this from a sound designing um, approach. So basically, the uh, the Novation circuit is a very powerful little groove box. I mean, it does a number of things really well. Uh, but one of the things that the circuit actually is, is two six voice polyphonic uh, synthesizers and with a whole load of power underneath the hood as well. So throughout this session, we're going to take a good look at the synth engine that's in there. We're going to have a play around, maybe design some sounds as well. Just explore some of the various kind of things that you can do with the circuit synth engine. Now, as always, I'm going to try and keep one eye on the comments section over here. So, um, yeah, so if you've got any particular questions, um, anything you want to ask, feel free to, to put it there in the chat. Um, every so often I'll just dip in and see see what I can uh, what I can see and uh, <laughs> hopefully give some answers. Um, so, um, yeah, let's uh, let's crack on. So I'm going to just um, uh, switch to this camera here. Um, and uh, yeah, if we go here, there we go. So this is obviously the Novation circuit. Um, and right next to it here, you can see we've got the components software. Now, obviously the, um, uh, the, the circuit is a totally standalone device. It's, um, it's a self-contained groove box. It's even got its own little speaker in there as well. And, you know, this thing is designed really for you to allow you to make music wherever you are. Now, of course, one of the things about the um, about the circuit is the fact that we have no screen on here. We have eight pretty much unmarked pots here as well. We've got a lot of feedback from the LEDs, of course. The color coding on here is really powerful and very, very, um, you know, kind of, it's a great interface to work with. Um, it's, it's, you know, you just have to glance at the circuit and you can see exactly where you are. You know, so it's designed to be this kind of self-contained, 
um, a, a device for you to, to allow you to make music on there. Now, of course, inside here, we've got four drum tracks. They're called drum tracks here, which are all um, basically samples that we can access. So we've got our um, two sequences uh, co-joined here, drum one and two, and then the same drum three and four. So four independent uh, sample playback uh, tracks. And then we've got our synth tracks as well. Now, of course, on here, we are, again, we, we don't have the screen on here, so we rely very much on these macro controls. Um, and obviously, we've got a lot of presets as well. So to get to the presets, of course, you press shift and synth. And now we have access to 64, two pages worth of different presets that are stored onto the device. Um, and we can access those at any point. But equally, we can use the Novation Components software, which is totally free software, of course. Um, you can download this, you can run it standalone on your computer, or you can even run it from a Chrome or Opera browser as well. So wherever you are in the world, you can always have access to your uh, circuit packs and your circuit, um, you know, circuit samples and that sort of thing. So yeah, but let's let's take a look. So we just click on the circuit here. So this is the kind of the landing page when you open up circuits and we click on circuit and it takes us initially through to the librarian. And of course, in here, we can see our sessions, we can see our samples, we can see our already stored patches. Now, obviously the librarian is a great place for you to manage all your sessions, all of your music. Um, obviously you can use the, uh, the, the, the components librarian here to upload your own samples into the circuit as well. But what we're really gonna concentrate on for this particular session is the editor. So I'm gonna go up to the top here and I'm gonna just click on editor and yes, I do want to leave this page, but that's fine because I didn't do any work in there. And here we are directly into the Novation Circuit Synth Editor. Now, of course, uh, uh, Novation Circuit is based around two synths. We have Synth 1, which is the purple synth, if you like. So when you're on that page, you've got your purple key keyboard. And then we have Synth 2, which is the green synth. Um, and both of these synths are identical, but of course they're totally independent. So you can load, um, they can load a sound into synth one or happily load it into synth two as well. I mean, it, it, obviously it doesn't really matter there. So let's explore a little bit about the circuits synth engine. So as I mentioned, it's, um, it, it's a six voice polyphonic instrument. And what does that mean? Well, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do, actually, before we do anything, I'm going to go to the browser here. And in the browser, I can again access different patches here. But the thing that I want to do here is make a new patch. So from browser, I can just click here, new patch. And once we've done that, then basically we have um, my, <laughs> my well, probably the sound that I use the most. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but it's the sound that, that I always listen to. And that is an initialized patch, a basic uh, patch. Um, which is essentially just a single sawtooth waveform. Uh, now you might um, you might be wondering how's he playing the uh, the circuit? Um, you can't see his, his hands. His hands are not there. Well, here they are. <laughs> they do exist. Uh, basically, I've got here a launch key mini attached via a MIDI connection, which is coming out and is running into the circuit here. So I'm basically um, accessing. Uh, the, uh, the synth engine from a key bed here. And it's a really useful thing to do. If you have a MIDI keyboard controller with, um, you know, with a MIDI output on there, um, it's always quite nice to be able to play the synth with the keys as well. Of course I can play here from the keys, no problem at all. But here I've got from a keyboard here, I can, I can, uh, I can sort of play a little bit uh, more. I've got, obviously I've got uh, a two octave key, key range on here as well, which gives me a bit more scope for being able to play. Incidentally, if you did want two octaves on the circuit, you can press shift and the note button, and that will open up a second octave. And you have got two octaves there. Um, but for now, I'm gonna stick with the, the launch key mini. So yeah, I got a little digress there with the, um, uh, uh, with the, uh, the launch key mini thing, but basically what I've got now is a simple single sawtooth uh, patch um, loaded into synth one on the circuit. Very basic stuff. And this is the first page that we're going to take a look at. Now, circuit 
is actually a very powerful synthesizer engine. It's 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 based on the Nova synth engine, and obviously Novation, um, we've made Nova synths for a long time, the Supernova, the Nova, um, all of these things, the Ultra Nova as well, and of course the Mini Nova. And in effect, the circuit synth engine is basically the same as the Mini Nova, with a few subtle differences, I guess. So the Mini Nova is a three oscillator synthesizer engine, um, with the circuit, it's actually a two oscillator synth engine, but we can still do a heck of a lot with those two oscillators. Um, and yeah, I, I think on the Mini Nova, we have 18 note poly polyphony. On, on the circuit, we have, well, I suppose you could class it as 12 note polyphony in total. We've got synth one and then synth two, but each of those can basically play six notes. So we can play chordal stuff on here as well. And of course we can um, we can set up mono uh, patches as well for bass sounds and that sort of thing. We'll look at that as we move through. But I just want to spend a bit of time um, essentially looking at this page now. Um, and this is kind of the fundamental, the starting point, if you like, the building blocks for your patches. And this is where we do our work with the oscillators. Now, over on the right hand side is really kind of, I would say, this is the primary kind of area. This is a mixer. And you can see here that oscillator one is turned up. And if I just play a note and then just turn that down, you can see, of course, that's just basically affecting oscillator one there. Now, I've also got a second oscillator. Now, if I turn that up, we don't hear too much difference. You hear a little bit more brightness coming into the sound as that second oscillator is added. But if you look here, oscillator two is basically the same wave shape. So we're playing the same wave shape twice at this point. But there's the, the mixer control. As well, we've got a noise generator within circuit. So again, we can bring the volume up for the noise here. There's a ring modulator as well. And this is basically summing the two oscillators together, oscillator one and two, and then giving us the difference between those. Now, again, at the moment, there's no difference because we're set to the same, uh, the same sawtooth and the same pitch and everything. So there's not gonna actually do anything. But if I just knock this out ever so slightly, oscillator two, you can start to hear that will have a bit of an effect now. And if I make push that out even further, start to hear that kind of ramping up a bit. Let's go for a different pitch. So you can see now that by having a completely different setting um, for the second oscillator, we can start to play around with the ring modulator's sound as well. So let's just bring those back into position. Oop, there we go, just back to zero. And we're back to have the ring modulator not having any effect. Then beneath that, we've got two volume controls. One of them is pre-effects. So this is the signal of the raw patch that we make before it hits the effects processor. Um, and then we've also got a post effects. And these are really useful for leveling your patches after you've done all the hard work. But let's take a look now at the kind of things that we can do in this page initially. And we're just gonna pretty much stay on oscillator one for this point. So of course we have a sawtooth here. And the sawtooth is, you know, a very kind of harmonic, rich, uh, kind of buzzy sort of sound. And if we click there, you can see we've got a whole variety um, of different options here for our oscillators. So we can set it to a sine wave if we want. Now you might need some loud speakers to be able to hear this. It's quite a smooth sound that doesn't have too much harmonic content there. Um, if we go to triangle, the next shape here, then the triangle is very similar to the sign, but there's a little bit more kind of brightness um, available in the triangle. Then we have the saw, the one that we started with. And then underneath that, we get into quite interesting territory. So we have our kind of basic analog wave shapes here, sine, triangle, and saw. And then down at the bottom, we have pulse width and square as well. So again, these are kind of analog wave shapes. There's the square. And if we go to the pulse width, now we have a square wave, but this time we can use this control, the index control here. And the index control is going to allow me to basically move the position. And in fact, you can see this with the wave shape 
move the position of the on and off period of that waveform. So that's interesting because we've, we're now looking at this index control as well. And the index control is basically a scanner, if you like, for your waveforms. So this index control can be very powerful and used with a lot of different wave shapes that we've got in here. So for example, we were just about to look here at the saw pulse width. Now this is basically a sawtooth, again, but this time we have a scan that we can move through that wave shape. Now it's quite subtle on this particular one. You can see that affecting the wave shape in the editor. And if we move down, let's go for something a little bit more kind of unusual. And you can hear now how that wave shape it's really taking quite a, making quite a big difference to the way that that sounds. And in fact, as we go to the extremes of the index point here, you can hear that wave all goes very quiet. And that's because we've basically taken the high point of the energy out of the waveform. So we can use that to kind of get a bit of a nice tremolo sort of sound if we applied an LFO to it, which we might now do later. But we can just use this basically start and shape the sound. Now the oscill oscillators are really the first point in any kind of sound patch, I guess. You know, they are the, the starting point, they are the things that generate the initial sound. And of course we've got lots of things that we can do to the sound afterwards, but it's always worth spending a bit of time on your oscillators and getting them just to where you want. So these are all under the classic um, uh, heading here. So we've, uh, I don't know if that's a, a visible actually on the, on the screen that I'm sharing, but these this group here are called the classics. And then underneath that, we have the wavetables. And we've got a huge amount of uh, wavetable options here as well. So let's have a look at this. Let's go to, um, let's go to Digital Nasty. Why not? Let's go for that one. And now you can see the wave shape is totally changed. But once again, as I scan through that wave, you can hear the sound basically moving through these different wave shapes that are in there. And I think we have nine different wave shapes available here that we can move through. So once again, this can have a really big impact on the sound. Let's take a listen to something else. Let's go to collection one. And once again, you can hear now how that's smoothly moving, smoothly interpolating between these different wave shapes. And you can see the wave shapes, of course, coming up. Now, that brings me on neatly to this next control here, the interpolate. Now, this is by default set to pretty much 100%, or in MIDI terms, a uh, value, well, here, of 127. Now, there are 128 different values available for each of these parameters, um, and they start from zero. So if you count zero as a number, they go all the way up to 127. That gives us 128 different discrete values. So with the interpolate on full, you can hear how this very smoothly moves between them. But we can affect that behavior by changing the interpolate function. So let's just bring that down now. Let's go all the way down so we can hear it in its most extreme. And now as I index through, you can now hear it stepping basically through those different wave shapes. So we've got a couple of different options there that we can use to essentially start to work with the, the waveforms. Now, let's um, go back to, I'm gonna go back to a sawtooth, why not? Because the next one um, is gonna be just, well, yeah, the tuning, I guess. And for this, I'm gonna bring in the second oscillator. So let's just play um, a nice minor chord, bring in the second oscillator. Now you can see here that the controls for oscillator one are identical for oscillator two. They're exactly the same. They have exactly the same functions and exactly the same kind of controls. So now we've got the second sort, the volume is up. You can't hear too much difference there, but watch what happens when I start to play around with the, um, the scents. Now these are, actually no, let's start with semitone. So this is a way of tuning the second oscillator. And this is gonna work in musical terms. Each increment there is going to be a semitone. Okay, so we can use that to basically change 
the different um, yeah the different uh, uh, pitches uh, for the sound. Now watch what happens then when we go to the sense control, and the sense control is basically a fine tuning. So as soon as we start to play around with the scent there and just push that up a little bit, we can hear that the sound thickens up really quite nicely. This works really well on sawtooths. And basically that's as the oscillators, this, this second oscillator is a little bit, tiny bit faster in terms of the amount of oscillations per second as oscillator one. And you can hear now how that is actually having an effect to the sound. Okay, so this is pretty basic stuff, but I mean, it's still all very useful and important stuff. Okay, so let's bring down oscillator two now and let's have a look at what we've got here. V-sync, density and detune. So what are these? Well, oscillator sync is when you have two oscillators and one of the oscillators resets itself when the other oscillator is um, reaching either its high point or its low point. What does that mean? Well, basically, as I change the pitch of one oscillator, as I mentioned, I'm going to have a faster waveform in terms of how many cycles per second one of them is going to be faster than the other. And if you have the waveform resetting before it's finished its cycle, um, you can get some quite interesting things. Now, normally, in certainly in, in the analog world, you would need two oscillators to be able to do this. But a lot of the Novation synthesizers have what we call virtual sync. And it's exactly the same thing, but it just means we don't need a second oscillator to be able to use it. So here is the V-Sync control. And this would be effectively as if a second oscillator was synced to it and I was changing the pitch of that oscillator. So you can hear now we're getting this really... Um, really wild kind of sound that we can get from the V-Sync, but it's not at the expense of the second oscillator. So I can bring in the second oscillator. Let's set that to, I don't know, a triangle. And then I'll just bring in the V-Sync for the saw. So you can see that again can have quite a nice big effect on the sound. Okay, next to the V-Sync, we've got density and detune. And again, this is a nice feature that allows you to kind of stack up virtual waveforms on top of each other. So if I increase the density here on a sawtooth, now we're getting quite a lot more waveforms actually going on there. But again, we can't really hear a great deal because they're not detuned. And that's where the fun of this density stacking really comes in. So let's just detune them a little bit. push that into some quite nice areas as well. So you see that even though we've got kind of what looks like a quite a simple kind of set of controls for each of the oscillators here, we've actually got a lot of stuff that we can do with it. Now let's move across here now onto the next tab. So we're going to move now into the filter section. And of course the filter is a very important part of any synthesizer as well. Certainly obviously of subtractive synthesizers, uh, which is primarily what this, uh, this synthesizer style is. And the filter is the ability to basically change a, the harmonic content of the sound by filtering out uh, certain frequencies. Now, of course, you probably, well, a lot of you, I'm sure, will be already familiar um, with what the filter is doing. But for those that are kind of new to synths and new to sound design with it, this is a very important part. So the oscillators, let's say these generate the sound, and then the filter allows you to color that sound by applying a set of kind of harmonic uh, parameters um, to that sound. Now we have three distinct filter types that we can choose from and each one of them has a different character. So this is what we would call a low pass filter. And we can see here again from the graphic, this section here is basically where the sound is coming from. The lows are allowed to pass out. Now we can change the behavior of that. If I go to 12 dB per octave, this is gonna be a much less aggressive filter now. Let's go back to 24 dB per octave. This means it's gonna take out more quickly. Okay, so we've got two, basically two different styles of low pass there, 12 dB or 24 dB. And then if we move to band pass, you can see now, 
you're allowing just the section in the center there. So we're ejecting the high frequencies, we're ejecting the low frequencies, and we're just allowing that section through. And again, that has quite a distinct sound. Now, one thing that's really nice to do with the band pass is to just push up the resonance. Now, if you look at the graphic here, you can see that's just gonna push up, if you like, the height or um, essentially a, a, a kind of a, a focused point of where the filter is being cut out. And you kind of get a, a kind of a slightly more nasally kind of um, kind of sound there from the band pass. Let's take the resonance back out and now let's go to the high pass and this of course is now the opposite of a low pass. So if it's set to zero all the, all the uh, frequencies are passing. If we move up we're going through the high pass uh, and we're just letting the high frequencies pass through until we get to the very top and even though there's still some sound coming out there my old ears can't really hear that particularly very well. <laughs> So let's just go back to the low pass now and let's just add a little bit of a resonant peak there and you can see now on this where that little peak is on, this, on the graphic image that we've got. Now we've also got this Q norm control here and essentially this is going to really kind of widen that peak. Now let's just bring the filter down a bit and this little area here is kind of sort of quite a sharp shape, quite a quite a big hair, uh, quite a tight hairpin, and the Q norm is basically going to just widen that out a little bit. It's not represented graphically here. Um, let's just bring up the resonance, and you can kind of just hear it having a very subtle effect there. But it's nice to be able to control that because that allows you to kind of dial in some nice, authentic, older kind of style sounds. So that's the filter section as well, of course. Now over here, we've got two dedicated modulation controls. Now what's a modulation control? Well, basically these are things that can affect, effective, well, affect the, <laughs> the filter. Lots of effectives there, but anyway, these are things that will affect the filter. And at the minute we've got the key track set to 127, so full, uh, full uh, range. Now as I move down, as I move down the octaves here, Basically, with the key track, the filter is actually subtly moving around. And this is really to basically kind of mimic the real sound of, of acoustic instruments, if you like. The kind of the higher up in terms of pitch they are, the more open and kind of brighter the sound is allowed through from the filter. So the key track is quite useful to kind of basically give you a nice range across the keyboard here, uh, just to, um, yeah, to kind of control the filter in a, in a kind of a natural way. Then we have envelope 2 to frequent, uh, frequency. So this is probably one of my favourite controls, but this is now applying an envelope. If we look over here, envelope 2 here, this shape is now going to be applied to the filter control. And you can hear that having an effect on the filter. Now if I take that all the way down, it's basically like me doing this but having something to automatically do it. Now, of course, I don't want to sit here doing this all the time. But if I add the envelope two to filter cut off, let's bring the filter frequency down a bit so we can hear it. So there we go. So the envelope there is automatically connected to the filter. And again, a really useful thing. But we can do a lot more with this, which we'll explore in a moment. Now, finally, on this page, I just want to talk a little bit about this control here. This is your drive. So this is a distortion. So if I just bring that up a little bit. Just to add a touch more resonance there. Now this is quite a subtle, what we call diode based uh, uh, distortion. But if we click here, we've got a whole load of different distortions. So we could go for a valve style distortion. Again, quite nice and subtle there. For this particular sound, let's go clipper. That's starting to beef up a bit now. Let's go down to rectify. This should start to 
get again a little bit more kind of heavy duty. Then we go into bit reducer, which starts to play around with the sound. You can hear that really breaking up now here when we've got all the all the kind of frequency open. And then rate reducer. That really is broken. This is basically like a sample rate reduction. And again, that's quite gnarly and a bit mean, but it's it's a certain type of distortion. <laughs> anyway, let's bring the drive back down. And then finally, this little section here on this page, the routing. So we have a normal routing, which basically means that oscillators one and two. So let's just bring in oscillator two. So oscillators one and two are both running through the filter. But if we go to bypass oscillator one, oscillator one is now not running through the filter. So you can hear there now that the second oscillator is still being affected. And then if we go to oscillator one and two bypass, the filter has no effect on that. Now you might think, well, why do we want the filter to have no effect on the oscillators? Well, if we go back to the oscillator page and just take a quick look, we also have a noise and a ring modulation control as well. So let's just uh, put that up to seven. Let's go, yeah. So now we've had added noise and we've still got some of the ring mod in there as well. In fact, let's just bring those down a touch so it's a bit balanced. And now when we use the filter, you can see now that the filter cutoff is still affecting the ring modulator and the um, noise sound. But oscillator one and two are not running through the filter. So again, this is really useful when you're working on your sound design. You can choose what you want to send through that filter. Or if you want to not send the oscillator through the filter, you can do that as well, of course. Right, now we're going to move on to the modulation. Now, when I talk about synthesis to people, I kind of explain that really we've got three key things in the world of subtractive synthesis that we can uh, use um, to basically create our sounds. So the first thing is the oscillators. I mentioned these before. Of course, these are the things that generate the sound. These are the little waveforms that are running incredibly fast and oscillating, as their name suggests, at such a speed that we humans hear it as a pitch. You know, when you hear people talking about, for example, tuning to 440 hertz, where when, you know, kind of modern orchestras tune to 440 hertz, that means that for the note A, every time you hear that in the middle range, um, you're going to basically hear 440 cycles, 440 repetitions of an oscillation in a second. Um, so these are the things that are basically generating the sound. Then, as we've seen, we've got the filter there to further shape and color that sound. We can use the resonance to bring out certain peaks. We can use the frequency cutoff position to find certain points that we want to um, cut out and emphasize with the resonance as well. We can apply an envelope to that as well. Now, that's the third part of really a subtractive synthesizer, and that is what we call modulation. So basically with modulation, we have, well, we've got many different types of modulation, but the two that we're going to concentrate on in the editor here are basically the envelopes and the LFOs as well. So we've got three envelopes. And if you look here, these are little shapes that we can use and apply to things. Now, we've got three of these, so it's quite a lot of power here. And the first one is basically the amplifier. So let's go back. Actually, I'm going to go and just reinitialize my sound. So let's just go new patch. And now we're just going to hear our beloved sawtooth. OK, and we've got our envelope here. Now, this is the shape that we're hearing. So when I press a key, I mean, I've got my launch key here, but I'll just press it on here so you can see. But basically, I press on. I'm going to take my finger off. It basically stops. And if you look at the shape here, the, the on period is very, very short here. And it just basically immediately starts. I'm going to take my finger off. We have this little tiny runoff here. So let's do, let's make a change here. Let's add a bit of attack. So this now, this section here is now going to apply this shape to the amplifier. And what does the amplifier do? Of course, 
it basically amplifies the sound. It allows the sound through. It's the volume control, if you like, for want of a better description. So now if I press it, you can hear now how that attack phase is having an effect on the volume of the note that's allowing it, that's being allowed to pass through. Now, interestingly, oscillators are always making a sound, um, but obviously the amplifier or the amp or the VCA or whatever you want to call it is the thing that allows that sound to come through. And this allows us to basically shape how the volume works. And this particular envelope is specifically connected at present to the amplifier. So let's now, I tell you what, let's bring down the sustain and let's bring the decay back a touch. Now, when I hit a key, we're going to have a very short attack, so it's going to sound pretty much straight away, and then we're going to have a rundown of the volume to get to this level where it will sustain whilst I'm holding the key. And you can see if I hold the key, it's very quiet. You might not be able to hear that. In fact, let's just bring that up a touch. You can hear it. So basically this shape, this envelope is now essentially controlling the amplifier. Now let's add some release and see what happens then. So when I take my finger off, there's a long release period and that's it. It's very straightforward and simple really. And again, these are really powerful tools to be able to shape the sound. So how do we shape the sound? So um, basically we've got a dedicated envelope shape here for the amp. Um, and we've got two additional uh, envelopes as well. Now envelope two is already hardwired, connected via this control, envelope two to frequency cutoff. Um, it's already kind of there for us. So if I just bring that down and we'll just add an amount so we can go either positive or negative. Negative is quite an interesting thing, but we'll go positive for now. And let's go add a bit of resonance there as well. So now you can hear that having quite an effect on the sound but let's go to uh, envelope two let's just add an attack to that maybe um we'll bring up the sustain a bit here now the release won't have an effect unless i've got some amplifier release so let's just put a long amplifier release on there as well and now listen to the way that the filter's working So basically, you can then just use this shape directly in the filter. No kind of connecting to anything else is required. Now, another thing that we have here is a velocity control. I'm going to bring that back to being sharp attack. Take the sustain right down, take the decay down as well. And let's now add velocity to that. Now, velocity is how hard I strike the key on the keyboard. Oh, hang on, let's just get the... Uh, this shortened bring the release down a bit actually yeah let's just bring a bit of velocity into the amplifier as well and what this means is that the harder i strike the key the more the amplifier is going to open let's just bring that down a touch bring more velocity control in and again i can do it on the pad here you see the harder i hit the pad now Basically, we're going to get more velocity uh, control out of the sound. So again, we can use this to basically choose how much of this envelope is going to affect something, which is pretty, pretty handy and nice to have as well. Especially useful if you want to have more expressive kind of uh, 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 control over the amp. When you talk about velocity, normally you kind of consider that as being the main control for volume. Um, it is on a piano, of course, and that's kind of where it comes from. The harder you strike the piano key, the harder the hammer hits the string and therefore it's louder. So often you will apply velocity as a value to your amp envelope. So we've got these three envelopes, but how do we do more stuff with it? Well, this is where things get very interesting. Now, across all of the pages, you'll see we've got the same thing at the bottom here, the modulation matrix. And the modulation matrix is really kind of the, the power powerhouse, if you like, of the circuit synth. Um, you may be familiar with modular synths. And the modulation matrix is basically like 
having a modular synth within the circuit engine. Well, what does that mean? Well, with a modular synth, you plug, you take some a signal, a source signal, and you apply that source signal via a patch cable normally to a destination. And here you can see we've got a whole load of destinations and we've got a whole load of sources. And we've actually got 20 different mod slots here, modulation matrix slots. And this means that we can do a lot of um, powerful modulation stuff directly with the circuit engine. So let's go to, let's say, source. And let's say, let's take envelope yeah, let's go envelope three, mod envelope three here, this one. And let's say we're going to apply that to the pulse width. Now it's called here pulse width in this list, but that is actually referring to, if we go back to our oscillator page, the index point here. So let's go and get in um, an interesting wave. So let's go for... Let's go for this one, saw one nine. And again, as I move the index point, you see here, we can change the sound. Oh, hang on, let's just bring the filter back up so we can hear what's going on. Let's take that down, go to oscillators. Okay, so that's good enough. Now we're gonna take envelope three and we're gonna apply it to pulse width, but we need to tell it how much we want to do it. So this is our depth control here. And you can hear now how that's automatically basically moving this around. But I can set the start point here from the index control. And if we go to the envelopes page, envelope three, we'll add a bit of, a bit more attack, we'll add a bit more decay, bring down the sustain. And with this one, we can add a delay. So this allows me to ha have a little period before that kicks in. come in afterwards as you can hear there's a little delay and that will then apply the envelope to what we're doing here which is the pulse width so the mod matrix is a really powerful system here now what else can we do well we can go to the lfos now let's just take a look at the lfo page here and what i'm going to do is i'm going to take an lfo go to lfo one plus and minus and we'll apply that to pitch yeah this is a nice easy sort of starting point for that so now if i bring in the depth you can hear now we're getting Basically, this LFO, this low frequency oscillator, this very slow moving, same as the main oscillators, but just slow moving. And we're applying that now to the pitch. And again, I can increase the rate. Or really slow it down. And again, we could apply that to something else. So let's go to the frequency. Let's just bring it down a bit so we start to get a bit of movement there. And you can hear now that's starting to have a play around with the uh, with the with the filter. And again, we've got different shapes here. We've got a lot of different shapes, so we could have a sawtooth. And I can do some interesting things here. Where I can sync this. So basically, now. We can sync it so that it's in key. We can also set it to a common sync here. Now, watch what happens if I press two notes. I'll do it on this one so you can see. You can hear the two LFOs working kind of independently. We've got the two different notes there and you can hear each note kind of repeating there with the LFO. But if we set it to common sync, now we just have one kind of time, if you like, uh, triggering the LFO. And how, no, it doesn't matter how many notes I add, all the LFOs will be in time with each other. If we take that off again, you'll hear now if I play some additional notes. You can hear that the LFOs are basically running independently. We can also set them to just trigger once. So you can do that sort of thing as well. 
Okay, so, um, I mean, there's lots of different controls here. Again, let's just have a quick look at some of the stuff that we've got here in the LFO style. So, for example, we've got different sequences and different shapes that we can use. So let's go for major. And let's, instead of going that to filter frequency, let's go to oscillator one pitch. And now we should hear, when I press a note, we're getting basically a major scale. Okay, so let's go back to the oscillator. Let's bring in oscillator one as well. You can hear that kind of running just underneath it. Let's change that to, I don't know, let's go for the vocal one. So the LFO here, we've got lots of different options. Let's go for a minor arpeggiator. So you could kind of use this like a little bit of a note sequencer for the oscillator pitch. And again, if we go take oscillator two down. In fact, why don't we apply this also to oscillator two pitch? A different amount maybe so we'll go to LFO 1 we'll go to oscillator 2 pitch and we'll add a different depth there and we'll just bring in oscillator 2 so we can do all kinds of crazy stuff with this as well I mean that's getting a little bit maybe out there at the moment but those sorts of things are available to us right we'll move quickly on because we've been talking a lot about the different parts here, and I really wanted to make some sounds using it all and we've not even got onto the kind of the uh, the macro controls yet. So um, it has been, yeah, I've kind of taken my time a little bit. Um, but just a quick word here. We've got our effects page as well. And Circuit, both synth engines have access to a phaser and to a cause effect. And also we've got some EQs. So we can use the EQs to basically sculpt and shape that sound a little bit more. Um, we've got more distortion. We've got another distortion here. And we've got, again, our different distortion types. And we've got access to a single kind of control compressor here, again, to allow you to kind of work with your balancing sounds. <laughs> Let's go to a rectifier here. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a little bit too out there. I don't know. Let's bring some chorus in as well. Yeah, that's probably one of the worst sounds I've ever made, but it doesn't particularly matter. It's just to, to demonstrate it. And we'll go to the settings page finally here. And these are things which are basically for your patch. So at the minute, the, the circuit is set to poly, meaning I can play um, more than one note. I can play polyphonically. But we also have mono, which means we can switch it into just playing a single note. So now... I can only play one single note. even though we're doing some crazy uh, modulation to it. And we've got auto glide as well. Now, if we have the portamento rate set up, let's just kill these, um, uh, these modulations. I don't think we need these for this particular bit. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the mono glide here. Uh, sorry, the auto glide. So if I... Oh, let's see if I got that right. It's been a little while. Maybe I've not got my portamento on properly. Let's see, where have we got that? Yep, here we go. This is where I should have looked this bit up before I decided to talk about it in a live way, but never mind. We go over to our settings here. There we go, I just needed more of it. So you can see now here with auto glide, if I'm in mono, no matter which note I play, we're always gonna have that that glide but if I go to auto glide if I play the notes separately I get no glide but as soon as I hold one down and press the next note we start to get that portamento coming. So that's a nice way of being able to give the patch just a little bit of extra movement. And then we've got finally a keyboard octave. And this is the octave range that the patch is stored with so that when you go to circuit and you go to your presets, you basically you can hear these are all running in different octaves. And that's where we store it here. And actually as we move around, they're loading in, you can see that uh, keyboard octave uh, patch changing. 
Now, finally, section for the synth design part here is going to really be the macro editor. And this is, again, where we start to program up these additional controls that we have. And this is where we start to really create the patch for taking away away from components and using this directly in the circuit standalone. So here we've got a nice patch that we uh, that created fairly recently. And you can see here these macros are kind of doing some interesting things. So this is basically macro 5 here. And if we had to take a look at it, it's controlling the cutoff frequency, the filter. Macro number four here is set to control the envelope shape of envelope two, the filter. So if I bring that down, bit of resonance in there as well, which is a macro six. Now over here, I think on oscillator, uh, sorry, on macro one, I've got some controls for the oscillator. Bit of pulse width index there, some tuning as well. Let's take these ones down. Pretty subtle. Yeah, very subtle amounts there, but they're there just to give a little bit of additional kind of shape to the sound. And then number two here, basically taking control of the mod matrix. So what I've got here are different LFOs being sent to different destinations and I've applied those four controls here to this one pot. Now this last one is quite an interesting one over here. So if we go to number eight, you can see here I'm using these different macro uh, controls in very small ranges. Let's see how that works. So at the minute, Portamento range is going to work across all of the, of the uh, working range of this macro. And then I've got distortion coming in as well, and I've got an amount of up to 23, um, which is running the whole length of this macro control here. Then I've got my semitone tunes. Now let's just, um, let's just have a listen to a single note. Now at the minute we're just hearing, hearing one note. But as I move up to that halfway point, you'll hear a very sudden switch. There we go. And there I've basically added an um, oscillator two. I've increased the, um, or, or yeah, I've increased, or have I? I've decreased maybe, but anyway, I've added a second um, uh, uh, tuning for that oscillator. And you can see here, it's starting at position 64 and ending at position 65. So that's the only place where it's going to control that sound. Now as I move up further and I get to position number 89, then this will kick in and basically act as a switch for the next change in tuning. So I can use that to a nice kind of switch to bring in a bit of harmonic change. Just drop the filter, go to the effects, let's bring in some reverb onto it. And that's a really nice thing to be able to, to do using uh, these macro controls. So let's just take a very quick look at how we can program up these macros as well. So let's go back to our beloved um, initial patch. Uh, oh, let's go new patch. There we go. I've got a bit of reverb on there. I'll just take that off now. So let's say macro number one. I want to do, I want to go to this. I want this to basically control my oscillator. And I'm going to choose here. Um, let's go pulse width. And we go to uh, the macro page. And I'm going to say, OK, let's take the pulse width index of oscillator one and I want to have this amount of depth. Now, as I move this pot now, of course, you can hear that now having an effect on the sound. So 
let's get clever with this. So I'm going to go to this next one um, and I'm going to say, OK, let's go on this one to oscillator two volume. And I'm going to start that at, let's say, at position number 64. And I'll just drop that down to um, just to around there. So I've just got like a little window of three values here where the oscillator volume will come up on full. So let's just check that out. So, so we get to 64. Just about hear that kicking in. So let me let's see what we'll do. We'll go to our filter. We'll bypass the, um, the filter with uh, oscillator one and we'll just bring in a bit of resonance and free frequency um, for uh, oscillator two. You can hear now that passing through the filter. Which is nice. And then why don't we go all out here and we'll go to another one here and we'll say, okay, um, let's go for um, oscillator two sense tune. So the fine tuning. And let's just bring that up a touch. And I'm going to bring that up to the top here as well. And we'll get a little bit more. So as I move into that range from 104, we can see now we're starting to get that kind of control in there. And finally, I'm going to add a little bit of distortion on here as well. So let's go to the, uh, the filter drive section here. And again, at the very top here, from around about the same point, 104, we'll add a bit of distortion to the signal. Kind of subtle there. So let's go to our filter drive and we'll change that to a bit reducer. So we've got this nice control there um, within this macro. So we've taken four different um, parameters and applied them to this one thing. Now if we go to uh, let's go to macro editor two and this time we'll go and get hold of of course uh, the filter frequency and I'm gonna say let's bring that depth down so we'll go negative so as I run up I can see now I'm gonna just bring that down now a little tip here if I take it to the full range and then you basically set the depth as the destination value you want to get to so we all really want to get to that kind of value nice and subtle there okay that's nice then what we'll do is on the mod matrix we'll apply some LFO to the filter so the mod matrix down here we're going to say okay take LFO 1 and apply that to the filter frequency and we'll apply that amount now we don't want that to be always on so what we're going to do is we're going to take it zero here and then apply it from the list here so mod matrix one so now this basically is acting as the same as the depth here and of course this range this travel for the macro pot is going to be the active place so I'm going to set it from around about here and as we turn up you see now we've got open the filter we're closing the filter down We need to add an adept, don't we? So again, maybe that's a little bit too much. So we'll just take that back. And finally, what we'll do here is we're going to take LFO1's rate. And again, we're going to go to this top section of the available macro control. So at the top end of where we're going to work. And we're going to increase the, mac the LFO speed as well. go let's change the pull switch add the filter oh ah, yeah we've got the L <laughs> oscillator too haven't we in, on the volume control again that's perhaps a little bit much so just back that up in fact we can go negative there so it means the LFO will slow down as we go move on so from two very simple controls there We've got a lot of sound sculpting possibilities to be able to work with. And again, if I just stick a nice little touch of comforting reverb on there. And 
And of course, all of these controls are completely automatable. So let's very quickly finish off by just putting super simple beat down. Uh, the usual kind of thing. Let's go for... Uh, And let's just change those sounds up a little bit, I think. Let's just bring that velocity down a little bit. We're just I like to use the velocity with the drums here just to get a bit of a nice movement there. Let's go. And let's very quickly just tap in a quick beat so I get some sound. Okay, so very quickly put, put a little beat in there. Just gonna maybe get a four bar pack going. There we go. And just hit record. And then let's just see what happens. Then. Okay, very quick and easy to record in. And then of course now using my controls here. So we've now recorded in that automation into synth macro parts here really open that up got a lot of kind of interesting stuff going on with the sound let's just add a touch of side chain as well and we go um we've taken a really good kind of deep look at kind of all of the feature set that we've got on the um on the circuit it's a pretty deep synthesizer now i mean we've been kind of through feature by feature there really kind of just demystifying some of the controls some of the uh, different things some of it, you know, it might be if you're if you're very familiar with synthesizers, that might not have been that useful to you. But if you are somebody who's just kind of maybe starting out with synths, you just sort of you've got a circuit, you're making a bit of music using the circuit, um, but you've not kind of uh, fully explored um, kind of synthesis and building your own patches. This is this is a really great place to start. I mean, one of the great things that we've got really on this is of course we've got this editor with a really nice visual reference you can see kind of what you're doing to the sound for example with your pulse width stuff you can see what you're doing to the waveforms so it's really useful to kind of get an idea visually um, of what it is that you're working with so the circuit editor is really quite a powerful tool and it opens up this really powerful instrument um you know it's um i'm just checking out some of the um uh, some of the kind of the comments here as well and people talking about kind of you know the macros being the controls here and it's difficult to kind of understand and remember exactly where everything is well yeah I mean that is the case that is definitely true but the point is here we've got our ears and we're using these when we're actually sculpting and shaping our sound um, you know, if if it if it helps you when you're making your patches, maybe follow a specific format for the um, macro controls. So, you know, when you are um, kind of programming your stuff up here, you know, you can just simply say, OK, well, I want this one to be oscillator stuff. I want this one to become some kind of odd, uh, odd, uh, oscillator modulation. Maybe this one is going to be the cutoff. Maybe this is going to be a resonance. So you can kind of, you know, do whatever you want with it. Um, you know, if you look at a standard synthesizer, I guess, if you look at a, you know, kind of the usual type of synth, something like a summit over here, I've got here, you know, we've got a pot for each function. So everything that we've got here in the software to program up, we've got access to those pots. So of course that's like slightly different environment, but there's a lot of power to be had from, you know, getting to grips with these different macros. Now I've got something going earlier 
I hadn't actually uh, used my circuit for a little bit of time, to be honest. So um, when I was uh, doing a little bit of kind of prep work for this live stream earlier, I just got it back out and kind of just made something. And it was kind of, I think it's just a really nice sounding instrument as well. Um, you know, the synth engine itself is really quite a powerful little tool. So it's got a nice kind of marimba -y sort of sound. Bring in the kick. Go to synth one, so bring the volume down, unmute that, and just bring that in as well. So, and then of course, I can go to the patch and then start to play around with the sounds. So we've got all of that just coming out of this, you know, this little portable groove box. It's battery powered, it's got a speaker as well. Yeah, lots of lots of fun to be having. So I'm just gonna very quickly check into the chat room um, and uh, let's see if we've got any questions that might be um we can answer. There we go. Vimana, find the sweet spots by using resonance while lowering the cutoff. That's that's a handy little tip there, of course. Just peak the resonance a touch, and then as you're dialing down the, the uh, filter cutoff, it's just going to pick those uh, little bits out. Uh, oh, this is a good question. I guess this is what we'll finish off. Um, so, James Aston, Chris, could you show saving a patch and using the genre and category and how those work to keep track of your sounds? Well, of course, let's let's just have a quick look at that. So, um, I mean, I've got kind of a, a sound here on my um, uh, on my uh, 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 presets here. Uh, Phase Camp Headfire, I called that one. Um, and this is already saved. But if I want to save this patch, I can just go to Save to Patch Pool. OK, and then I can give it a name here and we'll just call this, you know, Test One. OK. Uh, now, of course, when I press the number one, my uh, OBS screen changes. But anyway, there we go. So let's call it Test 13 instead. <laughs> there we go. So it's called Test 13. And now when I go to my browser, over here are my user patches, and there is Test 13. And I can just click on that, and that will load in. Now, you mentioned about the genre as well to keep track of your sounds. Now, of course, if you want to, you can further label these. And you can just give them a, you know, this just helps you kind of organize your stuff. So I'm going to say that this is a classic sound and it is basically a pad sound. So now I've got these two labels, these two categories that I've applied to the sound test 13. And once again, if I hit save to patch pool, save to patch pool, I can overwrite that. And now when we go to the browser, um, we can uh, check in here and we can say, okay, I want just my pads to show. So if I just choose the pad here, there we go, getting old, a bit like me, and there's test, test 13 as well. And test 13, of course, has got that label applied to it, so that means that we can basically just kind of quickly find that in the list of patches that we've created. Uh, let's see. Okay. Right. Well, I think that's that's around about it. But basically, thank you very much indeed for joining me this evening. I hope it's been useful for you. As I say, I mean, it's been a quite a gentle, basic look at kind of the parameters that are available in the synth engine, as opposed to kind of going off down the uh, the rabbit hole of uh, of kind of just finding and making your own sounds. Really, that's kind of for you guys to go out and explore with the, you know, with these uh, functions that we've gone through today. So thanks very much for joining. As I say, um, I hope it's been interesting for you. Um, we'll be back soon with another live stream. In fact, I think coming towards the um, sort of middle of December, we might have a bit of a special one. It's still in the pipeline at the minute, but I think it, we can try and pull it off. And hopefully it's going to be a nice 
sort of yuletide fireside chat with myself and synth absolute legend Esan Gelsi, who's also a colleague of mine. Um, and we're going to, I think, probably have a glass of brandy or a glass of port, talk synthesizers a little bit, and hopefully we're going to have a jam, which will be very interesting because I'm based in Brighton here in the UK and Esan is over in, in Melbourne in Australia, so ten and a half thousand miles away. But we're going to try and see if we can make that work. Anyway, I hope you're able to join us for that. Um, thanks very much for joining me this evening and uh, have fun with your circuit. So, yeah, thanks very much indeed. <laughs> 